first school of education doctoral student colloquium of the 1920 academic year so we're really excited to have you all here and thank you for everyone that's joining us online uh, we have a new classroom uh, we have new technology for the colloquium so we're really excited to try this space out for this academic year so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Joy Phillips she's going to be our moderator for today's session so thank you so much Greetings all. It's wonderful to be able to serve in this role for the very first um, student colloquium of this year. I'm very excited to be here. Um, we are also launching the Doctoral Students Research Brief Publication Series that coincides with our Doctoral Student Colloquium Series. And for the students who present at um, the colloquium, they will prepare a research brief based on a summary of their presentation so that they can disseminate their information in a concise format with a focused and explicit purpose. Um, over this academic year, you'll see that the research briefs may include preliminary or pilot studies, research explorations such as literature reviews, works in process, progress, research issues related to education or completed studies. So students are at all different stages of the process when they present, or maybe. So each month, um, for those of you who've attended before, or for those of you who are new, you know that we will have one EDD student and one PhD student present their research at this colloquium, which is both on campus and via Zoom, as you know. Um, and each of the student presenters is asked to prepare a research brief about their work that we discussed, which will go into the research brief publication series. So we're so very pleased to have so many people attending today, although I can't see those who are in the room, um, but I understand from listening to the conversations that there are quite a few people there, and I just want to welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to um, serve as a moderator. So there's a, slightly, a slight change, I believe, in the format um, starting this year. So we've asked each presenter to take 20 20 minutes to um, share, up to 20 minutes, to share their research. And then we'll, so we'll do that one by one. And as each printer, as each presenter completes their presentation, then we'll have about a 10 minute period for question and answers. So then we'll move on to the second presenter. As um, you can tell then, so we'll have about 30 minutes per presenter. So, when we get to the question and answer period, um, you are certainly willing, welcome to speak up or enter your um, question into the chat box and we'll try to get to all the questions and comments that come up. So let's get started. Our first presenter today is Brian Delaney, a PhD student. And I can tell you, I think probably everybody knows Brian since he's involved in pretty much every project in the School of Education. <laughs> so he is a doctoral student in educational leadership and learning technologies and a research assistant in the Drexel University School of Education. His research foci include journalism and mass communication, education, online learning, educational technologies, mind, brain, and education science, the learning science, and instructional design. In February 2018, Brian was selected as a co-editor of the Emerging Voices in Education Journal, or what we fondly called EV, for a two-year term. He earned a master's degree in higher education administration with a concentration in e-learning technologies and instructional design from Drexel in 2016. His master's thesis was entitled Assessing the Compatibility Between Experiential Journalism and Online Education. He explored how a journalism school at a four-year public institution of higher ed built experiential learning opportunities into its online program. He earned a master's degree, a 
a bachelor's degree in journalism from Ithaca College in 2004, and he was award-winning journalist in newspapers and radio over a career of 16 years. He spent five years as an adjunct lecturer at the Ithaca College Park School of Communications, teaching intro and investigative journalism courses and hosting workshops on interview strategies and leadership for student media organization. He spends his spare time with his wife, Stephanie, and their two children. So Brian, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many familiar faces back in our uh, great new space. And um, it's my privilege today to present the first colloquium of the 2019-2020 academic year. And today I'll be presenting on a literature review I've been working on, on traditional and non-traditional students, titled, Will the Real Non-Traditional Students Please Stand Up? Uh, this lit review is in progress. I'm about halfway through analysis, so I'll be updating um, on the findings so far and explaining what's left to do to complete the project. A quick uh, review of the agenda. Okay, so why this topic? As some of you know, uh, one of my interests is uh, the study of andragogy or the theory of adult learning. And that is particularly important for those of us who have an interest in online teaching and learning, where the diversity of individuals uh, that enroll uh, in online programs really runs the gamut. Um, and so part of my research interest is to try and find out as much about that subset of students as possible. And as a recent search of uh, popular news clippings goes, uh, non-traditional students, which comprise a large portion of adult learners, um, they're, very, they're very commonly talked about now in higher education and in the media at large. Uh, Yale has a program, uh, among other universities, specifically targeting non-traditional students. Uh, this topic is important because there are um, <clears throat> uh, predatory loan practices that target students who may not be as familiar with the process of um, paying for school with loans. Uh, enrollment is increasing with non-traditional students uh, and, and uh, across disciplines, not just in education. Uh, California is opening a new community college specifically to address individuals who have fallen through the gaps in the workforce between the ages of 25 and 34. And of course, think pieces will be everywhere uh, giving their uh, takes on how we should be uh, <clears throat> working with non-traditional students as educators. And this uh, quote I found yesterday, I just wanted to add in from uh, Angel Perez, that specific to small private colleges, if they're going to embrace the non-traditional student, whatever that means, they will need to uh, redesign everything that they do. So with, with those prompts in mind, uh, the contribution of this, now there has, has been lit reviews on this subject, there's been three. Um, uh, one on characterizations of non-traditional students in mental health research. One, the determinants, the characteristics of uh, non-traditional students, which um, aligns a lot with what I'll be doing today, and services and support programs for non-traditional students. What, where mine contributes is I'm looking specifically at those publications that address non-traditional student populations while also defining traditional students in those articles. So I, uh, that's specifically because one of my um, uh, primary uh, impressions of this literature stream is that we, don't, we talk a lot about non-traditional students without actually making clear who a traditional student is and what that student looks like. I'm going to be uh, utilizing uh, the theory of intersectionality uh, to frame this article. 
And uh, one of the things that Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a, a law professor at UCLA and Columbia and is a civil rights advocate, uh, talks about, um, and I quote, she said that particular values attached to categorizations create social hierarchies and inequalities. And those categorizations we're talking about are traditional and non-traditional students. So I'm, I'm just going to play a quick 30 second clip of, of uh, Kimberly Crenshaw explaining intersectionality. We're understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Okay, so with that statement, I think perfectly encapsulates um, why I'm, I'm approaching this particular topic with, um, with a literature review. And uh, in this research, I want to use intersectionality to identify the potential shortcomings um, of considering our social characterizations of different student groups and, um, and, how, they, and how we need to support them during their education. So some key definitions. I'm gonna start with uh, tried and true uh, the dictionary. Okay, traditional, handed down from age to age, adhering to past <coughs> practices or established conventions, not adhering to past practices or conventions. Okay, you probably understand that, but I think these are important to keep in mind as we think about the, rem the ramifications of some of the descriptors that are used to, um, that are assigned to students uh, in higher education. Now the US Department of Education has uh, the, the, the definition for both traditional student and non-traditional student that is cited most often in the literature. There are others, but in the analysis, as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the Choi 2002 article is the one that you'll come across the most. And for traditional students, that means three things. Uh, you earned a high school diploma, you do not work full time, and you rely on parents for support, which, um, is certainly up for uh, discussion and critique as a definition. Non-traditional students, there are seven factors. And note that not one of these is associated with age. That'll play a role later in our discussion. Um, lacks high school diploma, delayed enrollment, part-time student, uh, self-finance or financially independent, a full-time uh, full employee, we're working more than 20 hours per week. Uh, a caretaker, whether taking care of parents or loved ones or, or whatever, single parent, but also any parent, even uh, students who um, have a partner and are returning to school fall into this category. So with that understanding of the definitions, both in the literature and at large, generically speaking, the two research questions for this lit review. One, which determinants are utilized to identify non-traditional students in the literature? What are the categories that we're associating with that term? And then second, how do research studies specifically looking at non-traditional student populations define traditional students? All right, and so is that dichotomized relationship something that is marginalizing certain groups of students that are attending schools in higher education? I relied a lot on Booth and colleagues for um, structuring the methodology. Uh, when you do a systematic literature review, uh, one of the things that, uh, well, three things that it needs to be, it needs to be clear, it needs to be valid, it needs to be audible. And so your, your method should be replicable uh, by someone who would like to uh, validate the work that, that you've put into it. They should get the same search results. They should, they, uh, within reason, should see your coding explanations in the articles that, that are found in those search results and so on and so forth. So the, I started by looking at like five databases for this, and then I realized that EBSCOhost is this enormous um, entity that has almost 20 smaller databases included in it. And, and, and some of those you might search individually, like uh, CIN AHL is a common one. Well, EBSCO incorporates that database in its searches. So I, after a little bit of, of um, uh, 
discovery, I found that EBSCOhost would, would certainly give me a broad uh, result to examine. The search terms, non-traditional student and non-traditional student uh, located anywhere in the text of an article, whereas in the abstract, it had to say higher education, college, or community college. The timeline for the search was 95 to 2019. Some uh, limitations in terms of criteria, English only, US-based studies. So if the authors were located internationally, but the study took place in the States, that was, that was okay. Peer reviewed articles only, no dissertations, no lit reviews, no conceptual papers, uh, and only empirical research with the, um, with the tie in that the, the sample that was being studied had to be um, at least partially um, identified as non-traditional or traditional students. <coughs> so the original search, and I'm sorry the text is, is small, uh, Prisma charts aren't great for slides, but uh, the original search uh, came back with 647 uh, hits, uh, which 100 of those were duplicates, so that got us down to 542. Uh, so I screened the abstracts, titles, and keywords for 542 articles and deleted 389 for reasons that uh, just didn't match the inclusion criteria. Full text articles assess for eligibility. So 153 need to be read and coded. Um, I've gotten through 77 of those, 153. So today's results will be on the 77 of that 153. Uh, and at some point in the future, I'll finish the remaining 76 and add the, uh, uh, the findings together. So to give you a sense of just where the publications fell. Now, this is the... 50, we're down to 54 publications now because of the 77 I started with. Um, 23 were excluded for reasons like they, the studies did not take place in the US or um, I missed that the sample did not include non-traditional students. Maybe it was documentation or some other uh, way of, of conducting analysis. But so now we're at an N of 54 for the rest of, of this discussion. The majority of articles are coming from the 2011-2019 timeframe, but we do have four as far back as 95. So one of the core conversation or the core elements to discussing who is a non-traditional student and who is not is by categorizing by age. And the most common is 25 and over, which um, hails back to Bean and Metzner in 1985. They have some work that is cited fairly often. Uh, but as you see, there's no clear understanding of when a student becomes non-traditional if you're determining only by age. Uh, you could have undergraduate students who are 23. You could have undergraduate students who are older. Do you have to be a graduate student? So there's a lot of debate in terms of how old is a non-traditional student. Um, interestingly to me, 18 of the 54 did not identify an age parameter, and most of those are citing the U.S. Department of Education definition. Okay, so these are some of the determinants. Now, anytime one of the 54 manuscripts associated non-traditional student with one of these descriptors, I coded for it. Okay, so if you're seeing a cat or a category that you would expect to see here, like international student perhaps or immigrant. Uh, I just haven't come across it yet, which is why it's not represented on the table. But as you can see, it's a real wide range that goes well beyond any definition of non-traditional student that we've talked about. Veterans are very common because they'll often uh, uh, work in the military for a certain amount of time and then come back and access school either through the GI Bill or other means. Um, caretakers and parents are commonly cited. Individuals who are, who are employed, um, Surprising to me, not, not many uh, associations with online learners specifically. Um, and then uh, very little overlap with students who um, are attending school uh, with disabilities. So to me, this adds a little bit of, um, I guess, validation to my hypothesis of we may not quite understand who we're talking about as a literature base when we are when we are writing and, and researching non-traditional students. This one is probably um, the most important result that I'm finding. 
is that of the 54 articles, uh, 26 have actually defined traditional students. So 28 of the 54 are not defining that particular category. Because if you're going to define non-traditional student, then by definition, everything that you are not putting into that bucket then must be a traditional student. That's kind of the, the way dichotomized categories work. Um, but what that does is it's leaving us with, uh, <clears throat> with, with, with a, um, an unclear ability to discern you know, from programming who we should be supporting how, sh how we should be supporting them, how we should be training our staff and faculty and peer students to work with different groups. And so I'm really interested in how this uh, number pans out over the course of the remaining 76 articles that need to be analyzed. Okay, so some qualitative data. Uh, these are sample definitions of traditional student from the 26 that actually defines traditional student. This one was really common, ages 18 to 24. Uh, this was a little more simplified. Those entering college the same year they graduate high school. There was a couple that specifically identified primarily middle class and white, and we're going to talk about that uh, uh, approach in a second. And then this is the, for, uh, the formal U.S. Department of Education definition. And for non-traditional students, this and, and this part is really all over. So older, part-time and commuter students. And commuter and transfer students are two groups that are, um, uh, are really hit, uh, hit or miss uh, in the literature when, when it comes to defining them as non-traditional or not. Uh, 25 years and over, having, uh, being over 24, having a family to support or being employed full-time, more, more likely to be married, have a child or children, be employed, or be an ethnic minority other than Asian. And so one of the things about the label traditional student is that when you look into the history of higher education, um, you don't have to go far uh, to go back very far to identify um, time frames where higher ed excluded access to large groups of people in this country. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education, just as a, a time point in 1954, uh, ended segregation, but then it took two decades to see full integration uh, throughout most of the country. Gender um, uh, quotas existed into the 70s and 80s, um, and, there are, and, and there are legal challenges still ongoing today about access. I think there was a, a big lawsuit at Harvard that was just settled in terms of the affirmative action admissions policies there. Uh, but you'll, you will see um, the fight for equity and access to higher ed, those legal challenges continuing to this day. And so when we think about the term traditional student, who are we actually referring to? Um, traditional for who? And that's why I think uh, Levin and colleagues and some of the other articles that specifically added white middle class to the discussion are trying to keep that historical perspective in mind. Uh, unfortunately, out of the 54 articles that were analyzed so far, that's very uncommon to have that perspective added. Um, and, as, and as we noted, not everyone is, is defining traditional student. So lastly, uh, we want to be aware of dichotomous labels. Okay, be aware of how traditional student the, the terminology can marginalize a great swath of students that are now interested in attending or actually attending higher education. Uh, know that non-traditional students, even if, you know, depending however you uh, define it, that group of students is now by far the majority of students who are enrolled in higher education. It's above 70 percent. Um, I look forward to finishing this analysis and, and publishing on it. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, within the next six months. Um, but uh, at this point, those, those the findings that I've that I've put together for today have given me additional confidence to see this through. I think it's going in, in a direction that um, will frame the importance of of keeping traditional student definitions in mind as we develop research designs or programming or curriculum 
both face to face and online for our uh, for our student body and whomever that might uh, entail. A list of references and special thanks to my family who have uh, just been so patient with me over the last few weeks as as I've been getting ready for uh, for for today's uh, presentation. Dr. Batus, who, who is very supportive of me, and Dr. Kelly, this uh, idea for this uh, lit review started in her class last spring, and she was gracious enough to spend some time with me this week to discuss intersectionality and just make sure that uh, um, that, I, that I was doing that framework justice in today's talk, as well as my cohort um, and, and good friends who, uh, who are always there to support. So thank you, every, everyone, for your time, and look forward to uh, not speaking anymore. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian, for that really excellent example of how to use a, or how to conduct a systematic lit review. I think that is um, a great contribution in of itself beyond the findings of your study. So we have a few minutes to take questions. Um, and um, who would like who has questions? Anybody have, online or in the room? Rebecca, I have a question. Um, I think I read that uh, one of the definitions was any ethnic group other than Asian for traditional, right? Yes. Do you have any, I mean, I assume you read the article. So why did they come up with Asian not being, uh, Asian being considered traditional and the other ones not being considered traditional? I think it was reversed. It was uh, everyone, uh, Oh, so Asian is the non-traditional. Yeah, they're, uh, yeah, calling Asian traditional, and I think that's a medical a medical journal uh, article where uh, Asian student population is the majority in the program that was being analyzed. And, and they're so, considering that non-traditional. Is that correct? They were say they were saying that the Asian group of students is traditional. They were calling oh in the med school. Yeah, in that in that particular setting. And I included it because I thought that that was a really unique perspective on categorizing. So it means like Latinos would be non-traditional in that setting. Is right. that correct? Right. Yeah. So Asian I, is also a very, very broad category. There's, um, it includes East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. So it's a little, I mean, it's just very broad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had, I had a very similar reaction. I read it twice to be sure that I Right, right. Uh, um, thank, thank you. Do we have other questions? Yes. I yes, have one question. <laughs> First, thank you for the great presentation. I really think this topic is very, very timely uh, and worth studying, of course. <laughs> so my question is, uh, with regards to the determinants for the characterizations of non-traditional students uh, in literature, I was surprised to see low numbers, such low numbers for online uh, environments. I, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about it. Do you have any possible explanations? Yeah, I was, I was surprised too. And I wonder if just by random draw, the 76 articles that I have not analyzed yet include perhaps more of the online student samples, because I know pulling the articles and reviewing them initially, there are more than 10 that deal with online learners. And so it may just be as simple as, I haven't quite gotten to that uh, group of... Yeah, I'm just curious if the determinants would be different from face-to-face uh, -face or blended classroom environments, like whether you will also see difference in the characterizations. Right. Yes, thank you. Dr. Ghosh? Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm piggybacking uh, both on Rebecca's and Thomas' points. Um, in your review, um, are you also looking at patterns across like fields? Like as you said in the med journal, this is what seems to be the trend. So I'm curious, like maybe online learning is more common in certain fields versus the other. So are you going to look at that field specific pattern? I mean, that's a great idea. I haven't quite gotten to that point. I'm taking a lot of notes and, and making codes of things that weren't included in this presentation, but that is not one that I had considered. And so, I mean, I, I, it wouldn't be difficult to go back and see exactly, you know, what the disciplines are or 
grad versus undergrad. There's a tremendous amount of literature in this in this review that is specific to non-traditional undergraduate students um, versus graduate students, and that could explain part of the disparity of online because those undergraduate students are largely on campuses. Um, but in terms of disciplines, that would be an interesting uh, approach. But I'll try and, try and add that so in. We have, we have time for about one more question. It's always so very difficult to have a full conversation in the short time frame that we have available. But um, other questions? Anybody online have a question or comment? Sure. Dr. Beth? Sure, I've got a quick question. Sure. So Brian, in looking at the definition that the federal government has, and I, I posted the link online, it's interesting because almost all of their resources date back to 1994, 1996, and it's literally the page when you go to NCES, and it's how non-traditional is being defined. Because the materials are much older, do you think this could be causing just some of the confusion? Because things have changed drastically since 1994, and almost all the citations are from those earlier years. So just curious. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. It's, I, I agree that it is playing a role particularly because when you, when you think of the slide of the majority of these articles have been published since 2011, there's no question that uh, academia and, re and education researchers are responding to the rise of uh, the diversity of, of, of student um, enrollment and studying different groups uh, that, that are quote unquote non-traditional uh, at a higher level. But the problem is there hasn't been an article to offer a better definition that, definition that everyone can agree on. So I think people are almost instinctively going back to that 96 Horn and Carroll article and the Bean and Metzner yeah. 1985 and, um, and the Choi 2002 because <laughs> it's everywhere in the literature. I mean, it may not be the primary definition, but in almost every article, it's being cited as most people include these uh, uh, identifiers as non-traditional, but for the uh, purposes of this study, I will use this definition. And so even though it may not be logged as uh, the, the Choi 2002 may not be logged, it's almost universally cited in each article. And I, I, I personally believe it shouldn't be. I think we've moved on from, you know, from, from those antiquated de definitions. Yeah, no, thank you. Great response. Yeah, and I wish that we had more time to take more questions, but we need in a second to move on to our second presenter. Um, but just to Dr. Betz's point, I, I had wondered, and you can answer this later, I had wondered why, why you had chosen to um, use a 25-year span for the Lit Review and whether you explain that in your written document. Um, you can tell me the answer to that later, but I think that's, <laughs> that would be important to, to include in your written document. And it, it speaks in part to Dr. Betz's point. But thank you very much. Another round of applause. For we have Dr. Scott as our second speaker. Making his way to the podium, I expect. There we go. So while he's getting set up, I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of information about Dr. Scott. He is a newly minted EDD graduate from our program. And he is, so he now is Dr. Scott. He successfully completed the creativity and innovation concentration, and he defended his dissertation in August, 2019. Um, he's actually my, my student. Dr. Scott has been an instructor of English as a second or foreign language for 13 years. For six of those 13 years, he's been an adjunct lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania. His approach to pedagogy encompasses viewing the entire classroom experience through a constructivist lens. From this social constructivist perspective, he created an original heuristic model that he calls Please Ask that aims to clarify proper noun article use in English. His doctoral dissertation involved a phenomenological look at English language learners' 
lived experiences as they engaged with this creative, please ask, heuristic to comprehend the article system before proper nouns. Prior to his doctoral studies, Dr. Scott obtained a Master's of Arts from New York University in TESOL and Business and a um, Bachelor's in Finance and Investments cum laude from Bard College at CUNY. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at Beijing, hmm, I'm not going to say it right, Yangtong University in China. And lastly, he is multilingual and has deep overseas experience. I think he speaks five languages. Is that right, Rinaldo? <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Scott. Obviously, but you know, good morning to all of you. And um, Dr. Phillips, I didn't want to interrupt you, but good morning to you and Dr. Betts and Dr. Geller, who may not be there now. Every, every week. <laughs> right. So, um, okay. So, just to get started, this is my my topic is please ask the impact of please ask on ESL student comprehension of the English article system before proper nouns. And it's a phenomenological study. So basically, to start out with, um, all of us are certain things that we take for granted because we speak English. But um, basically, it's just a couple of uh, statistics on um, the ubiquity of English, and um, it's. Um, I'm so sorry, Dr. Adams. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but um, also um. <laughs> but um, you know, some just some quick statistics as of um, 2017, English is the most widely used language on the internet. Also, another interesting statistic is um, with um, English being the lingua franca around the world, which is the language that's used in, in, in business correspondence and in um, medical correspondence, jurisprudence, etc. Um, as of 2013, nine billion dollars at least has been spent on learning English every year, which you know hammers home the, the, the fact that English is important, learning is important. And since we're talking about learning and it's the focus of my study, grammar is the focus of my study. And basically with um, grammar, it's the foundation of, of the language, the foundation of English is the, um, the building block. Even now as I'm talking to you, there's a grammar that's present, but we just, we're not aware of it because we take it for granted. So if we didn't have the grammar naturally, we wouldn't be able to understand each other. So it's, um, it's really important. Grammar is important, but the only argument is how much grammar should be injected in a lesson, um, you know, in, in my field. But everyone can, you know, uh, agree that grammar is important on, um, on some level. So basically, this is my um, topic. It's proper noun article grammar. So basically, um, proper nouns are just nouns in English that begin with capital letters. Right, that are famous. So in English, you have a choice. You can use the or you can use no the. But that's the problem. We we know it naturally, but students don't. So they don't know what to use. So they just end up guessing it. And sometimes when they guess it, it's wrong and they get upset and da 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 da. So this is what I looked at. And basically, in the yellow is what's considered the correct answers correctly. And the ones without yellow are considered the answers that are a little faulty or sound weird to us. And this one, sometimes you'll have situations that, like this one, both can be used, right? So um, basically, this is a problem statement that my research um, attempted to address a problem lacking, uh, involving any clear explanation on what to use before proper noun, because you can use the, the definite article, or nothing, right? So it's addressing this problem, and it's a blend of felt difficulty and real-world dilemma, which um, in the, the field, the EDD field, Basically, felt difficulty is something that bothered me, and I wanted to do research on it. And real-world dilemma is more or less from a student's perspective when they tried to find the solution, but they couldn't, and it was frustrating. 
So the purpose of my research was to determine whether this thing that I created, just ex nihilo, like out of nothing, um, to help them, if it impacted how they understood the article system before proper nouns. That's basically uh, what my study was about. So basically, this is please ask. So it looks weird because we're thinking about it from a positivist standpoint. But basically, I sat home and I got a blank piece of paper and I wrote down every proper noun I can find. I also had coffee and wine. <laughs> you know, that didn't affect it, but still I was just kind of, you know, I still um, tried to get in a creative mode. And this is what I came up with. And basically, these are categories that I came up with that basically in English, we automatically don't use any definite article. So basically, you have park, airport, street, city, country, college. Now, I called it please ask K. I replaced it with three C's because basically in English, C and K are pronounced the same if, it's, if C is before the hard vowels, which is A, O, and U. But anyway, like with park, park doesn't represent this category. It doesn't represent a category of just park. Park is, it's parks and other manifestations of park. So what I'm arguing is that we see this, we know this naturally, it's in our soul. But what I did when I was home with the blank piece of paper and wine and coffee, I thought about it and pulled it out. So when I pulled it out, I saw it, drew it, and then I said to my students, here, look at it through there, can you see it? Ah, yeah, I said, good, just, do, but it doesn't make sense, who cares, does it work? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I did. So you have park, you have airport, you have street, or all types of streets, and then you have K, which is CCC city, country and college. Um, city and country is basically explanatory. With college, it's basically a, a, a constructivist um, category in which you have for-profit businesses, not non-profit, for-profit, houses of worship, schools, institutions, colleges, and universities are in that one category. So in front of all of these, we don't use the, right? So I just basically pass this on to them. So the literature review, um, basically I, did a conceptual, strength, uh, conceptual framework on three streams. So basically the three streams were a diachronic history of English pedagogy, especially grammar pedagogy, um, heuristics on article grammar, and then also a creative view of English. Now it was interesting to note that with all of the, the data that I read, all of the studies, no one could come up with any answer as to how to tell students how to choose. Everyone just said, look, the two type of things that came out of it. They would do a lot of research, and then when it got to proper nouns, they'll just stop. That was one. Or sometimes they would just say, look, just tell students to memorize or guess. So that's the only thing, and that was clear across the board, right? Um, so with my phenomen phenomenological study, I had a central question and two sub-questions. Um, basically, the central question, um, was the meaning of please ask for university English as a second language student participants. And the sub-questions, which directly fed into the central question, how do ESL student participants describe their comprehension of the proper noun article system using this please ask model? And how do students particip participants perceive their understanding of the article system linked to proper nouns, both before and after experiencing this creative uh, please ask um, heuristic model? So the site, basically, I had the privilege of conducting the research at a, a university in the northeastern part of the United States, and it was a, an ESL class, and it comprised of 11 students um, in the study. Uh, purposeful sampling was used um, to promote transparency and trustworthiness, um, which, you know, it's also credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. And it also just so happened that the students who who um, were involved in the study were from Oman, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, but I didn't intend to do that. It just happened naturally, right? So I employed different coding schemes, especially the coding that's described in Saldana, um, in vivo coding, uh, descriptive coding, et cetera. And then three themes emanated from the study, and in each theme, there were two sub-themes, or six sub-themes in all. At the um, in the study, 
So first, memorization. This just this kept coming up from students um, as I interviewed them. So basically, with memorization, it's two sub themes: classroom pedagogy to answer the proper noun article grammar. Um, all of them told me in one way or another that in their countries and also here, they were pushed to memorize. So basically, going back to the history of pedagogy, you have the grammar translation model, which is the first one, and basically. This model was only about translating, that's it. It wasn't about speaking English, so it's not a bad model, but it's not considered effective if the goal is teaching English. So this is the model that's pushed for students. So this study supposes that this is one of the reasons why they faced obstructions, right? And connected with this, I, I, I wrote the Einstein effect, right? Which is basically a German type of um, idea that we as, as humans that we keep doing something even though we know that there's something else that's better but we keep doing it anyway and that's what i found with grammar translation they would keep doing drama, grammar translation and they know there could be something else but they just keep doing it anyway right and then also the other side is frustration with um memorizing basically students um exhibited a lot of frustration with memorizing a lot of them told me it doesn't work and they hated doing it a lot of them said they hated English. They wished if English were a person, they wish they could die. They told me different things. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then the other thing is, with frustration with memorizing, I substantiated that with something that's called Cartesian anxiety, right? So, with Cartesian anxiety, it's not necessarily um, depression per se, but basically, it's something that when we as human beings, we see something in the world, we experience like this feeling of unsettledness. And in order to resolve the unsettledness, we have to resolve it rationally or empirically or both. So for them, they tried to understand this rationally, it didn't work. They tried to understand it empirically, it didn't work. So that's why they felt so frustrated. But with Please Ask, it was able to help them to rationalize it mentally and they were able to also do it, um, use Please Ask in natural life to see that it works. And then that kind of, um, that feeling of anxiety subsided. The next one is successful transfer of grammar to students. Um, two sub things, shift in attitude toward learning English, um, complexity theory of grammar. This is another word for saying um, systems thinking. And um, with this study, I had to prime them and kind of push them into seeing English a different way that English is a system that's crazy, but it's okay. So I always tell my students, English is crazy, but it's okay. I'm crazy too. <laughs> it's okay. Right? So it's okay, you're crazy, but I'm crazy too, Mr. Renal, that's good. <laughs> so I told them, I said, okay, so just as Lawson Freeman said, grammaring, it's an approach to grammar that, that accepts English as a crazy thing, not just a thing that's just everything makes sense and it's fine. The next one, higher complicated, comprehension um, with communicative language teaching. Communicative language teaching is the, is the approach to grammar that's used right now. It's, it's the go-to model. Now there's four things in communicative language teaching. Um, competences, grammar, competence, discourse, strategic, and social linguistic competence. The first three, a lot of programs are really good at doing, but social linguistic competence as Mede and De Kilitas said, it's hard to teach um, social linguistics and culture. It's very, very difficult to teach that. So with Please Ask, Please Ask was able to fill that void, the social linguistic aspect of it, because it was a way for them to know how we think. And lastly, impressions of Please Ask, descriptions of Please Ask, and Please Ask is a bridge to native speaker thinking. Basically, Please Ask is a metaphor. Now, we know metaphor as um, a way to beautify language, for example, uh, Shakespearean uh, and poetry and science, but also metaphors are a way to clarify things that don't make sense. So we have different domains. So we have one domain that doesn't make sense to us a lot, and one that does. This is a this is a um a metaphor that enables us to help us to see what love is because we don't really know what love is. That's why everyone can sing about it and it never gets old because we really don't know what it is. <laughs> That's why, you know, so we try to describe it through journey. 
So this is the same thing here. If I make a, a metaphor with this sentence, the article system before proper nouns comes alive in pre please ask. This is the thing that's obscure. And then with please ask, you try to understand this through this. So it's a, it's a conceptual metaphor, right? Conclusions. Um, basically, all 11 students said that they were able to comprehend <laughs> proper noun article grammar way better than in the beginning. Um, it was helpful, eye-opening for them, and it was easy for them to recall it when they needed to in conversation and in writing, which was important to them. Because honestly, some of them, you know, in my years of teaching, they would get depressed when they're not able to, to use the language well. Um, it, it was creative and fun, um, and it facilitated natural responses in their speaking. Um, this was an interesting one that a lot of them, the, the students in, the, in the, the study were 18 years old and above. So lowballing it, they were learning English at least six to seven years. So in that time frame, a lot of them told me that they expressly asked people how to use this grammar and they couldn't understand it. But with please ask three weeks and they were like, oh, I see the promised land. So it's with please ask, I'm not saying it caused them to understand things. Yes. Um, but it helped in some way, I'm saying. That's the only thing I'm saying. And then it's more than a grammar rule. This was big, but they would tell me they knew how we think, a, a link into our psyche, and it facilitated the internalization of social pragmatic grammar, which is so difficult to understand. This is basically the last slide, which basically shows that usually there's two worlds, their world and our world. So usually when we want to show them this grammar, we shove them in the water and say, swim, go, just go. I can't just shut up and go. This yeah. is what we usually tell them. But I'm telling them, okay, here's a bridge. I said, just follow me across the bridge. When you get to the other side, you'll be like us. So when they get to the other side, they become immersed in our world. And it goes from a dualism to a monism, right, basically. And that's basically it. Future um, mixed methods for quantitative research. And now any questions or ideas? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. Um, I think this is really an extraordinary example of studying a problem in practice that our EDD program is designed to promote. Um, but it's at the same time, it's quite intellect, it's very intellectual. So you've, you've done a fantastic job. So let's open it for questions or comments. They don't have any questions, they may be comments. Yeah. Anybody? Hi, I don't have any questions. I just have comments. So as someone from China, I am still struggling with the article system because in Mandarin, we actually don't have the article system. So we can't do the grammar translation, actually. And as I was growing up, my English teacher would told us just remember mechanically or just use our instinct. But we don't really have instinct because we're not native speakers. So I, I would like to thank you for thinking of such a fun and creative way to remember. for me, um... I try to do something that will help you to get things in, that you can think as we think. And that's what I try, that's what I always try to do. I try to do things to help you to think how we think. So, you know, thank you. Be Dr. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two questions. So first, this was great. I enjoyed it so much. Um, one of the questions I had was, and I know you may not know from your 11, in your sample, but I'm wondering if you have an instinct about it. Like, do you think that the native language of the speaker comes into play Absolutely. at all, as Absolutely. far as like how useful the please ask is or unnecessary? And then the other piece was, I agree with you that like the English language uh, is crazy, and I'm wondering how it is that you focused on this particular problem when I feel like there are so many other sort of inconsistencies, and if you have any. Um, I guess plans to tackle any other ones. Well, for me, it was a question that constantly came up because there's a lot of questions that students would just ask me about different things. So it's just one that I just happened to work on. One day they asked me, and they it was Thursday, like say it was a Thursday. I said, okay, let me think about it. I'll come back with an answer Monday. So over the weekend, I did the paper, wine, and coffee thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of language, quickly, yeah, language definitely has a bearing on how, like, you see the world. So I always use this scenario, like, I've had a lot of Russian students, 
and I grew up with a lot of Russians. So they will see things differently than we do, right? So we'll say, yeah, I went to the supermarket. I bought some stuff at the supermarket. You asked another guy, he says, yes, I went to supermarket. I said, that's it. He says, I said, you mean the? No, just supermarket. That's it. I said, you mean the? Why the? Just supermarket. Oh, uh, that doesn't matter. Why? I said, so, okay. So I know they don't see it the same way we do. And being around them, I know. It. You know, and having experience speaking the language, I know. It. Same thing with Latinos, and it's definitely a cross. So for me, when I make things, I think of the student, Chinese student, Korean students, or whoever. So, yeah. I do. Thank you so much for this great presentation. I really enjoyed it as a non-native speaker. Uh, and I was, I really feel the problem. I could feel the problem because I was teaching English for like seven years. And uh, something that I was wondering, because you were, your sample group were, uh, you know, adults, a student, like 18 years old, most of them, uh, or all of them. I was wondering, you know, grammar is something that the student, like adult students are more perceptive. Uh, I was wondering, uh, did you have like uh, any other age group of students who use this model, like younger students, uh, and see what are the implications, what are the differences? Actually, I have like zero experience with children. You know, I don't think that I'll, I'm going to. People say, oh, just so good with children. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so you're good with children. You know, but I don't, I don't have any experience with children, so I don't know. I just have experience with adults, so I don't know if it will work with them or not. So I'm not sure, but you know that's the only way that you know I can, you know, answer that. And also, let me say this: before I said supermarket, if there's anyone in here who's from Russia or any, do not be offended with that. I said I lived like around them. My godmother was Russian, so I understand how they think. So everything that I say, it's not trying to be like, oh. You're trying to say that we Russia. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it at all. I'm just saying that they see things a certain way in a really way that's really interesting and cool. That's the only thing I'm saying. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Other questions or thoughts or comments? Uh, anybody online? There's no one online. I have a, I have a comment. Um, so, I find your topic, to, like your presentation, to be very interesting because I'm Egyptian and I taught English as a first and second language in Egypt. And uh, a lot of what you said also speaks true to what we've experienced in Egypt, especially. Um, I didn't experience it um, while I was a student learning English. I experienced it more while I was learning Arabic. That's when we were taught to memorize, even though in theory that's supposed to be my first language. But um, I kind of, like, when I started teaching, my, and my department, we never um, really promoted memorization to students, but all their ministry, um, Egyptian Ministry of Education subjects, seeing Arabic, religion, geography, social studies, that's when they had to memorize everything. So I don't think that's just specific to learning languages. I do think that's more of a way of education in some parts of the world, not specific to languages, more like how to pass exams, sort of. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. You know, I mean, in my education, it was, you know, just whatever, just wing it, memorize it instead of actually um, learning it. So, absolutely, yes, I totally agree. And thank you. Okay, we can take about one more question or comment. Yeah, just a comment. I have a comment. Um, the presentation was really engaging. And again, I myself, I have been. Uh, EFL teacher for 11 years and, and in my home country in Armenia and also here in the United States. Um, I can definitely see uh, why you chose this particular topic within grammar because teaching articles is one of the most challenging units in grammar teaching. Um, and I, I experienced myself with my students when teaching my students and memorization is one of the widely used methods to teach articles. There's no other way. I mean, to teach them to see patterns, um, that's what it is about, and the, the overall structure. My, uh, and I really liked your comment about um, teaching students to be, uh, to be tolerant of ambiguity. Uh, so if it doesn't make sense, 
it's okay. You should be comfortable with that. And I really like that approach uh, because if a student wants to learn everything just at once, it's, it's just not possible. And teaching them to be tolerant of ambiguity really helps them to motivate them and decrease the anxiety. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for your comments, questions, and, and ideas. I think that certainly Rinaldo, Dr. Scott, has a whole future of research ahead of him that he can create more heuristics and study them. Um, so let's just wrap up uh, for the day. I want to thank Brian and Rinaldo for presenting today, two super interesting and well done studies. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this first session of the colloquium this year. We had um, 24 people online. I don't know how many people there are in the room, but that I get the sense that there's a fairly good number in the room and that's a great attendance. I'd like to ask you to mark the date for the next colloquium on your calendars now. It will be um, Friday, November the 1st. And all of the colloquiums this year will be on the first Friday, except for January. January, because of the holiday, um, the colloquium will be on the 10th. So thank you again all for participating. Thank our presenters for excellent presentations. And have a great weekend. Um, for the PA students, um, I just sent out an announcement this morning, but um, there is a professional development event on October 15th um, from 1130 to 1230. It is called a uh, dessert and discussion event. It's a professional development panel um, that's going to talk about what happens in the real world life after graduating with your PhD. So we're going to have some of our program alumni there, and then the panel will be moderated by Dr. Flowers. So hopefully you guys can make it. So we're all set, Eric. All set. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jamina, for your help. And Eric, always. I can stay. Keep him away from work. <laughs> Yeah, I just Yeah. Congrats. I just No, this is great.